Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon from Sirim Burhat. Thank you for being here today with us. Welcome to our forum presentation on technology platform towards affordable and cost effective digitalization process. I am Dr. Fazil Mohamad Hani, President and CEO of Sirim Burhat, your moderator for this afternoon forum. This afternoon, Sirim has gathered our collaborative partners from three organizations, Hitachi, Bosch Resource, and Huawei, to specifically focus our discussions on platforms used in manufacturing environment and how can you make digitalization an affordable and cost-effective journey. So before we begin, I would like to introduce our esteemed panelists. Uh, we have, I have on my left is uh, Mr. Chu Hua Singh, the Managing Director, Hitachi Asia, Malaysia. Mr. Chu started his career in, with Hitachi Limited in 1993, following his graduation from Hitotsubashi University in Japan. He has over 25 years of business experience in global sourcing, industrial smart technologies and business development in the energy solution business. In 1999, he received training in Hitachi America where he focused on research of supply chain management structure. He was then promoted to Deputy General Manager in the International Sales and Marketing Department in 2009 to drive the company's oil and gas sector rotating equipment business and the energy solution business. Later in 2013, he took a new challenge to be relocated to Malaysia to enhance Hitachi Asia, Malaysia's social innovation business and became managing director in 2017. Our second panelist uh, on uh, Mr. Chu's left is Mr. Roy Stan, director, Bosch Restworth Syndrome Bahad. Mr. Roy Stan is the director for Industrial 4.0 in Bosch Restworth Syndrome Bahad. He is an electrical engineer by training from Melbourne with an MBA from the UK under Bosch sponsorship. Roy is now entering his 27 years in the Bosch group of companies. For the first 16 years in Bosch, he was involved in the very intensive industry of automotive OEM, parts manufacturing, where QCD, quality, cost and delivery, and yearly cost down are the key demands of the OEM automotive parts industry. The last few years, Royce was instrumental in driving Industry 4.0 in Malaysia for the local SMEs. So he is quite well known among the SMEs. Bosch is one of the national consultants appointed by MDEC for Industry 4.0 digitalization. And Royce works very closely with many government agencies in driving Industry 4.0. Presently, Royce is also very active in training companies and being management consultant in Industry 4.0. Our third panelist is Mr. Lim Chi Xiong. Vice President, Cloud and AI Business Group, Huawei Malaysia. Welcome, Mr. Lim. With more of more than 20 years experience in the ICT industry, he possesses broad experience in digital and ICT industry development strategy and technology business solutions and sales marketing. He is currently responsible on Huawei Cloud and AI Business Group covering Huawei Cloud Intelligent Computing, AI portfolio, data storage, and intelligent vision solution. His mission is to support customers and partners to identify and develop the right cloud and AI transformation solutions and ecosystem to build a fully connected intelligent world. He was previously uh, holding a position of Chief Strategy Marketing Officer for Southern Pacific Region. So welcome all esteemed panelists for agreeing to be part of this webinar. Um, before we start, I would like to explain our mode of operation. A webinar is planned for about 90 minutes. 60 minutes for discussion and the remaining 30 minutes for questions and answers. As moderator, I will pose the same questions for each panelist. 
Since three of them come from different companies, we expect to hear three different perspectives. Mm. Each panel will be given three to five minutes to answer the question and share their experience. Participants and audience through Zoom and Facebook can use their respective chat room to post questions related to the topic of discussion. You do not have to wait until the end of the forum to post your questions. In fact, I will try to attempt to uh, get the panelists to answer in the middle of our discussion. Siri will compile the questions before posting to panel members. This will help us address all questions. So, uh, let me begin uh, by sharing with you on the reason why we chose the technology platform towards affordable and cost-effective digitalization process as the title for today's webinar. Uh, CIRIM has been uh, doing a lot of work with SMEs, uh, uh, developing solutions for SMEs for the last five years uh, under our CIRIM from Hofer program. I had a look at the data. We have done uh, work with 2,700 companies. Uh, we have audited nearly 1,500 companies. This is technology audits. And we have performed uh, a lot of technology interventions. And it has shown that many of our um, companies uh, are, to, to our surprise, are quite ready to enter Industry 4.0 uh, through a digitalization process. The reason being is that from our data pool, about 500 interventions that we did, uh, we did more, but we the analysis on about 500 companies, we noticed about 57% of the companies are in the Industry 2.0. They have mechanized their operations. About 41% is has already automated their operation. And these are SMEs, the small, medium enterprises. Uh, only less than 2%, 1.6% are in the Industry 4.0. So there's a lot, about 98% we are talking about the opportunity within our own database that can go forward into this Industry 4.0 era through a uh, purposeful, structured digitalization process. And of course, today we want to uh, ensure that this process is within the within their affordability. Uh, we, are, we realize uh, large local companies have the ability to do it <laughs> under their own, um, um, what you call, initiatives. Secondly, we are still in the uh, what we call the movement control order. <laughs> uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 started uh, officially in February, end of February, and uh, this pandemic has made a lot of people, companies-wise, that uh, to move faster, to move quickly into uh, digitalization of their processes. And uh, many reasons. Uh, one is because people are working remotely, or are forced to work from home. Uh, so the new normals have made many people to think. But within our own manufacturing processes, a lot has to be done to digitize. Uh, if you talk about digitizing the assets, processes, warehousing, mm. logistics, uh, the QA, QC process, mm. maintenance, and the general finance and HR. Digitalization will enable people to work from home remotely and still be uh, effective in their uh, operations. To make it happen, we need to place a base infrastructure. I think this will be discussed. But the infrastructure that we will be talking is technology platforms. Mm. And we will hopefully discuss why we use technology platforms. Connectivity is another area, and cloud is, of course, is the name of the game now. But before we embark in digitalization, I think we must inform our participants from SMEs that it is still 
a best practice to adopt lean management practices before you digitize. The operational transformation of operational technology must be done first, making best practices before even we go into putting our, what you call the IT solutions. Of course, this, this is in order that the cyber physical world be connected properly and we, are, we will be in the industry 4.0. So, I just conclude at the moment on my opening remark is that platforms are a prerequisite to digitalization and costs seem to be one of the stumbling blocks for Malaysian manufacturing companies, especially the small, medium enterprises. So making the right decision in your digitalization journey is vital. So today we have three panelists who will hopefully be giving us how to move forward into this journey. So I would like to pose the first question um, to my friend from Hitachi, Mr. Chu. Uh, as we are aware, Hitachi, Bosch and Huawei manufacturing facilities all over the world are using internally developed technology platforms. These platforms are already proven and are also being used by factories and outside of Japan, Germany and China. Perhaps you would like to share with us uh, the common types of platforms that can be used by Malaysian manufacturing companies. Such you, please. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think that uh, this is not suitable for me to talk too details about the technology or technical. But uh, what I'm glad to share here is that what is a suitable platform for the SME? But not only for the SME, but uh, for the, all the users. Because uh, we understand that the world changes very fast. The technology every year is the upgrade itself. And uh, our business module always changes from time to time. So the most important thing is that when we think about the platform, I think that we should uh, think about how to create or how to utilize a common open platform. What I'm trying to say here is that the platform that can adopt different types of uh, format uh, data or different types of system. So that in the future, if you want to change something, so we just uh, plug out and uh, plug in. Right? So in the world, I think that there's so many open platforms, but uh, which is the best platform that for this kind of user, I think the user, they themselves have to study and also have to look into details, their capability and their future plan. What kind of business they want to do in the next five years and next 10 years so that you can invest and choose the proper platform for your own companies. But don't just only simply jump into the technical pool and uh, try to pick up uh, one of the common platform or the best well-known platform. Because the best well-known platform sometimes may not suit to your business and also may not suit to your technology's uh, requirement. So for us, we Hitachi, we usually encourage people to think about the open platform and think about the things that you want to use in the next five years and next 10 years. So this will help you uh, to come up with a report that sustainable uh, uh, technology platform, which can uh, help you to save the money and also the time for the development. Thank you, Mr. Chu. Sir Royce? Okay, um, in Bosch, we have uh, presently 283 factories in the world. Three of the factories are in Penang. Um, we are in the business of making automotive parts uh, for OEM, semiconductors. So everything to do with timeliness, you know, uh, and productivity is there. So being uh, with so much things that we've got to connect in real, real time, we have developed our own system, and we call it MES, a very general word. Uh, manufacturing execution system. It is a platform. It is a platform that is uh, adapted to all our 283 plants. Um, so, and and because as uh, Mr. Chu said, things are moving so fast. Even we evolve it ourselves. So these are the platform that we offer to the SMEs, and it's just standard platform with adaptation to the SME. And this one brings down the cost substantially, and yet at the same time we are still improving the very thing. So you can. You can say that we are a lead producer of the system and we are, we are a lead user and also a lead producer of the MES. 
So what is MES, if I may say, a, a platform? Mm -hmm. Words like, for example, warehouse management, energy platform, OEE, uh, equipment utilization, um, uh, uh, tools management, um, digital quality system. These are the, uh, it's, it's a suite of software in the family called MES. Now, however, for uh, SME, I would caution from my experience after visiting more than 170 factories in the last two and a half years, um, most SMEs do not need a full suite. You're probably in the journey of the first three years, one or two or three softwares to manage most of the problems that you have. Yeah? So in a sense, I'm happy to say as what Prof says, uh, Malaysia uh, manufacturers and SMEs are at a certain level. So the uh, entrance into digitalization is not, is not so difficult. It's just to sit down and to really understand what you really need. First, identify your own pain points, your own requirements, your own needs. Then only match what is need, needed for you. Yeah? So we are here to assist you in this journey. Very good. Um, Mr. Lim, maybe you want to say from Huawei point of view? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rob. Um, so I think that the COVID-19 is really impacting all of us. Uh, so from Huawei company perspective, uh, since uh, it happened in China, starting in China, so uh, at that time, I think well, our company was very affected uh, since that uh, most of us have stayed at home, we can't go to the office. So actually in terms of production, supply chain, everything has, has been uh, impacted. Uh, but luckily that uh, actually for most of our staff, even we, we, we stay at home, uh, but all our communication remain the same. So, uh, so that, that is mainly because that uh, we've actually moved all our internal communication and processes, uh, everything into the cloud. So most of our Huawei internal process has been digitalized. So that makes us that uh, even we stay at home, uh, we still can uh, smoothly communicate uh, with all our peers, uh, colleagues, uh, even our customers and partners. Uh, more importantly is uh, whatever things that we need to get approved uh, in terms of all the processes is available from our phone. So internal, we develop an app called VLink. So that VLink actually help to interconnect uh, uh, 194,000 of Huawei stuff uh, around the group. So I think that really gives us a lot of convenience is that it is not just uh, used for email communication, but actually almost 98% of things that we need to make decision and approval are actually available from that apps. So, and because of our experience again in this, uh, these tools, so actually we are offering these two as uh, uh, public available cloud services to be offered to our customer and partners. So this is why uh, during uh, uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, so uh, our billing services actually has been getting very popular in China. So the, conveni the convenience and efficiency that Huawei has in our company, we offer that as a cloud services to our customer and partners. So I think that is uh, that is important that we, we uh, the experience and the digitalization uh, tools that Huawei use, we offer it as a services. And that services because it's over the cloud, so it can be uh, very affordable and somehow uh, somehow uh, uh, free of use for that certain period of time during the COVID-19. So, um, so I think that is the first thing that I would like to highlight that uh, so digitalization, we must always be ready for digitalization. So I think COVID-19 has teach us a very important lesson that uh, all our uh, company core processes and knowledge or even the communication platform need to put on the mm. cloud. Mm. Uh, so whenever, whenever you know, uh, where, where you work, anytime, you are still able to access uh, into the import, important information uh, uh, in your company. So I think that is the main uh, lesson that we learned. And this is why you know, very, there's a very famous uh, uh, quiz uh, saying that, so which CXO will actually speed up your digitalization? So it's not CEO or CTO or CDO, it's uh, COVID-19. Yeah, I think that, that teaches, and I think that lessons uh, is not only applied to the large corporate, but more importantly, you need to also uh, apply to the small and medium enterprise. Yes, I think China, um, because of the COVID started there, and you, Huawei had all these um, tools available, so you, you can see the benefit, right? Yep. 
uh, I'm happy that all of you three has solutions, technical platforms that are being made available now to even Malaysian companies. So uh, I'd like to go on to the next question that um, we would like to get your opinion on. Um, when you know the level of automation, I mentioned the level of automation, mechanization from our database, but you also know the size and sales volume of Malaysian companies. I'm sure you've been here. You can see our SMEs. Uh, they're not terribly big, but because of this pandemic, people want to move into um, the kind of industry four or smart manufacturing. Uh, the, I think the question is they are looking for what kind of advice, what would, what would be your advice to such machine companies based on their size, the volume, the level of automation, where they are, how to make them help make the right decision in selecting the most appropriate uh, platforms. I know Mr. Chu has alluded to making the right decision. How do you make the right decision based on your size and the level of automation that, or sales? Because it's an investment, right? You still have to make. Perhaps uh, anyone want to start first? Yeah. I think um, uh, from the visits that I've made, as I mentioned, about 170 factories, I notice one thing consistently. Much of the data acquisition is paper. It's very labor intensive. Writing, writing, then uploading and keying in. So this data is no longer real time. Not only not real time, but it's also not accurate. By the time it gets to the management, it's like half a day late, one day late, sometimes two days late, and many times not correct. So how can the management make the correct decision? How can the production planner do the right this, uh, planning? Yeah. So therefore, in digitalization, the key word is real time. At least a time that is reasonable for everyone to make the correct decision. So one of the best ways is before heavy investment, before thinking of anything to remedial, actually, yeah, is to digitize. Digitize means getting data from your production equipment, from the warehouse, from your tools, uh, tool rooms, and from even from your R&D. Mm. Yeah, so getting data, real-time, correct data. And, you know, and here is where the software gets involved because the software processes the data. Because even when you get too much data from the shop floor, your management is overwhelmed by data. So you need software, as I mentioned, to process this data in a timely manner. Uh, I give you a, a most simple one. Uh, we, we have made this uh, census that is paired to your mobile phone. So what it does, it has, a, it has a simple algorithm in there. It checks for the limits. Once the temperature or the vibration of the equipment exceeds it, the signal is sent to the mobile phone of the, um, uh, of the maintenance guy. He knows that pump needs to be serviced. <coughs> yeah. This is timely, real-time data acquisition. So data must be first obtained. Mm. It doesn't matter whether you have automated yeah. uh, processes or not, mm. but the data must be in digital form right. so that is real time. Yeah. I think that's the key message yeah. that you're saying. Yeah. So if I uh, uh, may add that, is, uh, now the decision, we can let the artificial intelligence to make the decision. So just uh, give an example. Um, so recently, uh, since last year, we have talked to us uh, a medium manufacturing line company called Hexa Food. So Hexa Food are producing all the chili sauces, spice, uh, spices food. So um, the important source of making the uh, the, 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 the ingredient is the is the chili. So um, you know, in their traditional factory line, they need to hire uh, quite extensive for labors to actually select the right chili, whether it are in good shape, colors, uh, and those that, that is not in good shape, they will have to filter out. So it's a labor-intensive uh, selection process that need to be uh, need, uh, need, need to be done in the factory. So um, we work with this uh, Hexa company uh, by using the AI AI uh, capability on the clock. So um, so since uh, uh, over the years uh, the AI has been it's really quite common in China. So they accumulated a lot of uh, experience and the tools. So uh, for Huawei, we 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 put these tools on our Huawei cloud. So, and that cloud with the AI capability, so Hexa can tap on this platform and, and, and come up with a, de a demo system of uh, how to use AI to select the right, uh, the good chili or the bad chili in just about 10 days. 
and to put this demo into the factory line, it, it, it took them about uh, 1.5 months to two months. So from these examples, we can see that uh, AI technology is not something that rocket science and is very costly to be deployed. So now with the beauty of cloud, uh, uh, it makes a complicated technologies into a modularized, modularized and standardized API interface for you just, just to call off. So, so this is, uh, I think, uh, a good lesson for most of the uh, manufacturing line uh, company in, in, in Malaysia is that you could just learn from Hexa. You, know, you tap on the AI capability on the cloud and you can actually uh, transform your entire factoring line, changing from an extensive labeling job into uh, automat automatic uh, robotic job using the capability of AI on the cloud. And whether this will cost you a lot, the answer is no. Actually, it's very, very cost effective to tap on the capability from the cloud. So I think with this, uh, with, with the current technologies of having AI on the cloud, it really will be able to transform uh, most of the factory. Because the components that required to do this AI job, robotic uh, uh, selection job is a camera and a clock. So the camera will capture whatever image or video it captures, send to the clock to make the decision whether it's a good chili or it's a bad chili. Then it will pass to the robotic arm to do the selection. So the components that is required is actually simple and, and, and affordable at this moment. Actually, what you say is quite true in our <coughs> program that we've been looking at um, this over 2,700 companies. About 40% that we've been looking at is food and beverage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time, their SOP yeah. or quality control on their raw material yes. mm -hmm. is not there or not consistent. Mm -hmm. With mm -hmm. that, what you say, you know, the material, the raw material selection can be chosen this in this case is uh, your chilies, right? Yep. For hexa food, and which is very important ingredient to for to making the next product, right? Yep. So, a lot of FMB uh, manufacturing processes, their raw material are not selected yep. um, using simple technology mm -hmm. camera and then with an AI to to make sure the material is uh, the right material. Right? Mm -hmm. I think this is what we found out when we do our audits. So your 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 solution, I think, is very would be very useful for Malaysian SMBs which are in uh, the FMB mm -hmm. sector. So, Chu, you want to add on? Yeah. Um, Vijitachi is a Japanese company, so we have a different thinking about the decision making. When uh, we ask for to decide how to invest uh, for the technology, so usually. Uh, most of the Japanese company they will apply the five step before they make a decision. Uh, maybe you will say that is too conservative, but uh, this is uh, our success story we applied from 100 years ago until today. And I believe that the Toyota, the Kaizen, we also use the same methods. Okay, so usually for the first step, that we usually encourage the SME, especially for the SME. First, uh, we will not ask them to immediately talk about the technology but uh, we would like to ask them to review and uh, to come up with a business plan, as I mentioned just now. Your business plan will tell you that what you want in the next three years or five years. Then the step number two is that we, under we need to understand who am I and uh, what is my problem now. So this is what uh, Roy said just now, the data collection. As uh, I know that in Malaysia, most of the SMB, they still use a manual, right? So actually we have a lot of data. People always say that I don't have data. But trust me, you have a lot of data. Everybody have a data. The problem is that we don't know how to collect the data. So this will be the number two, the step two. So we collect the data. Then what we should do with the data? We have to analyze it, right? So this is another problem for the Malaysia company. Because uh, we usually we reluctant to think how to solve the problem. So we always throw the ball to the supplier or we throw the ball to the consultant. But uh, in Japan, it's different. We always uh, try to sweat ourselves first. So we look into data, then we find out what is the data we need. Again, this is a very good point uh, from the Reuters now. 
the data, if it's too much data for you, then you are confused. Yeah. Mean that it's a flood. Flood is not because of the water, flood because of the data. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we have to find out what is the data you need, and then you analyze the data, and then you understand what is the problem you're facing now. Then you go for the step number three. Then again, then you try to review your work process. Because the we Hitachi, we have a more than 100 years of experience in the manufacturing. So we know that this is very important thing that for the operational technology. For example, that now you have the 10 process to complete a one product. But uh, from the data, if you can find out, actually you can uh, simplify it or streamline the process. From 10 steps, you go for the 7 steps. So you already save for the 3 steps. Okay. Then you go to number 4, the step 4, in that you go to the market and see what is the solution in the market. And then you study. Then the step number 5, you go back to the review again your step number 1, whether this solution can help you to achieve your goal or your target in the next 3 years or 5 years, 10 years. Then in the step 5, you make a decision. So you will choose the correct decision. So if you look at the, uh, the Toyota uh, Kaizen, it's very famous. Kaizen did not ask you immediately to think about uh, what kind of technology you should invest. But they will ask you to find out what is the root cause, what is the problem, and then how you can uh, solve the problem by the human being. So this is another one more keyword is that we call that uh, uh, human centric. Because uh, we are the manufacturer, we are the person. Suppose we are the person who should know well about the process. So if we cannot solve the process problem, technology cannot help you. And that AI is very important, I fully agree. But again, if we don't know how to choose the correct data to input into the AI, AI also cannot help you. Trust me, they cannot help you. So it means that we have to learn ourselves first. Then you understand who you are, what you want to be. Then after that, you choose the correct solution to help you to achieve the goal. I think that is the very important the process that we have to think about before we go for the investment decision. And also, again, we need to work together with the supplier. And uh, this is one more point that I would like to share is that uh, don't always rely too much or just uh, throw the ball to the supplier or to the solution provider. Because the solution provider may not be able to understand what is your problem. So they will give you a very objective uh, solution, but they may not match your problem uh, to help you to solve the problem. So the key point here is that work together. When you go for the final decision, then you try to implement the solution. Don't just wait for the outcome. You need to set up a team to join together with the supplier, the uh, system provider. So you work together with them. So this is one of the key work in Hitachi Group. We call it co-creative collaboration. Co-creative collaboration. This is very important. You share your knowledge. You share your pain point. You share what you want. Then the third parties, that the consultant or the system provider, then they will share your knowledge, help, help you how to solve the problem. So there must be two parties, disclose and accept, accept and discuss. So this is kind of a spider. Okay. This is my thing. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chu, because I think you, you have, you have um, in fact, um, uh, spoken for Sirim, because Sirim normally works with the SME. So, uh, sorry, the technical glitch just now. Um, so, in fact, that's what Sirim does. We work with the SME to do what kind of technology intervention, mm. but based on technology. That was our program. We, we, it's not the technology itself. Yeah. We need to understand together. I think um, our, we at Sirim agree with you 100%. Uh, looking at the root cause, looking at the areas, what, what you want to reduce, what you want to raise, what you want to you know, eliminate kind of thing, right? So these are the quality uh, approach that we've been using. Right. So thank you for uh, those comments. Um, I've been, uh, there's some questions uh, through our Facebook Live. Uh, the audience have asked, um, this is from Mira, right? He, I've been doing my, I, I read out a question, I've been doing my business the conventional way. It's hard for me to shift the traditional method to digital and it's, it's usually involved, will involve big amount of money to shift to 
digitalization. What is your advice on this? So I think similar thing. Anyone want to add on this question? They've been trying to shift to digital, but as well as the money, that's the roadblock for them. Any comment on this? Well, um, this question I think is very common, not only in Malaysia, I believe China, Korea, Everywhere. Japan, all have the same problem. But uh, why we always have the uh, thinking that digitalization, digitalization is very costly. First, I don't think it is costly. Don't always think that digitalization must need a very high-end and complicated uh, solution. Just think. Now in your production line, if you say that you do the conventional way business, okay, in the production line, you manually, you use the book to record all the data. So, okay, just think the first step. The first step is very simple thing that you can do is that, why don't that you use, for example, they use the Microsoft Excel, you just record from the paper to the Excel. Then I believe that the Excel, uh, this software is not so expensive. So this is the first step for you go to toward the uh, digitalization. Then you have the software, you have the Microsoft software Excel, for example, to re record your data, uh, their data. Then after that, you understand what you need, then you step by step go. Of course, if you try to immediately, you just think about the, let's say, the SAP ELP, of mm. course, it will cost you a million, a few million. But uh, if you are not ready to go there, then it's not meaning for us to encourage you to go for the big investment. So the digitalization not necessarily mean that you have to go for the AI or the ELP or SAP or something. But you can start from very simple thing. Mean that <coughs> you have to change the mindset. Mean that how to collect the data. If you change the mindset, you say that how to collect the data use the easiest way, then you will have a less frustration and uh, no worry about the big amount of the investment. Okay. okay. Yeah. Prof, and, uh, from my uh, after I've seen what happened in the market. A lot of people have been asked to give data from the floor, but they don't know why they're giving data. Mm. And um, so, I mean, this COVID is a very good example. We don't have to fill in our name now. We can just use QR code. Yeah. yeah? So everybody has a mobile phone. The moment somebody uses a QR code, he feels like, wow, this is very easy to use. Yeah. Mm. And immediately, pr data are processed. The other one would be simple, very ancient, barcoding. I am so surprised there's still many SMEs that don't even use barcoding. Yeah. And we're already moving towards QR and RFID and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So start very simply with barcoding. And most important, the person you expect to give you data, you must also give him the feedback or her the feedback that the person feel valuable why she or he is contributing this data to you. Yeah? Especially if it benefits the person's life, benefits her work, benefits her process and makes the person feel needed and important, then I think this digitalization journey will be definitely successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Lim, you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, maybe just uh, uh, one point is that. Uh, so uh, I think I agree with what uh, Ross mentioned. I think actually QR code is something that is very useful. You can mm -hmm. even turn a normal physical small store on the, uh, beside, beside the road that can become online. So by just using a simple QR code. So with that QR code, people can pay you through mm. the, the, the uh, e-wallet. So and people can uh, search for your store. So even for someone that doing pisang growing can be digitalized <laughs> by just using having a QR code. Yeah. So actually, the, the tools and the methods are there. Uh, so but the awareness is not there. So I think the, the awareness need to be uh, nurtured through a lot of you know, information uh, that need to be uh, shared to them, but I think more importantly is the is the is, is the is the uh, atmosphere or environment that we need to create for them. So, for example, uh, uh, you no, know, like like my wife at home, you no, know, he, he will, you know, she, uh, you know, she she actually spend a lot of time, you know, uh, browsing through the Facebook, uh, the Facebook that those because nowadays there's a lot of stores that are doing uh, selling stuff over the Facebook yeah. uh, broadcast, live broadcast. It's been so popular especially at the uh, uh, rural area, the tier three, tier four cities. It's been so popular, even those, uh, you know, uh, I come from a uh, uh, hometown was uh, Tanjongara. Mm. So it was uh, you know, near, near the seaside, those uh, fishery are actually selling the fish 
through Facebook live broadcast. And, and the business is so good, yeah. so good. People, th so it's actually, th th a lot of people are seeing the traction. So people start selling stuff are no longer just stick to the mindset of they have to go and rent a shop. Yeah. So they can just sit at their home. Yeah. The pandemic also forced them to go into mm. the Facebook, right? Mm. Yes, yeah, so, so actually th the method is there. The yeah. tools are there. Yeah. So it just needs some awareness to be created and slowly mm. and people more and more, they will jump into this. And, and, and cost, yeah. the cost to doing this is actually very low. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we, because of the pandemic, mm. the awareness, suddenly we were forced yeah. to be aware yeah. these tools are existing. There's another question from the Facebook, uh, Ayman. What are the pros and cons of implementing a digital transformation strategy? And what are the most common reasons for failure? Yeah. Anyone want to attempt to answer this? Digital transformation. <laughs> I think it relates to our digitalization yes. uh, thing, right? Yeah, I think that the common reason for the, yeah, the failure of the investment uh, for the digitalization is that if you use the customized uh, platform or we call it the customized uh, software, yeah. mm. mean that you already put yourself in the box. Okay, when the environment changes, you are not allowed to walk away or out from the box. So I think this is a, one of the key points, I mean the very common key point that people always fail when they do the digitalization. So this is why that I encourage people that uh, try to think uh, how to utilize, utilize the, call that the open platform and also the, call that the common software. Okay. Yes, uh, I think that question leads to to yeah, and your answer leads to my next question that I want to pose. Uh, many SMEs are concerned with cost. Um, many SMEs are concerned with cost, and uh, these are platforms, security, software license, uh, customization, update. You mentioned customization just now. Mm -hmm. I mean, let alone the updates, right? Mm -hmm. So, and the level of deployment of these platforms at the manufacturing side. So they're concerned about this cost you get onto a platform yes but then you are you you mentioned you may be stuck in the box but how how does the platform works against customization perhaps you want to clarify this further mm -hmm. because people may get confused this is still software right mm -hmm. and then we buy we we are we locked into that or is it open there was a mention earlier on open so these are things that i think Perhaps you can clarify to the SMEs. If, if I can share, uh, last year I had an experience of uh, being consulted to um, a, a large SME in Penang. Um, it's an old plant. I went there and I said I'd like to walk in the plant. So I did and I was very impressed for an old plant. They really managed it very well. And so I said, mm, okay, the thing that was in my mind is look at Pareto's law. Pareto law says that 20% of your problem is 80% of your cost. Yep. So I said, um, so um, last year, 365 days, how many days did you have lines, line stop? So it all added up to about 1.5 days. They said, not very much, you know, sometimes two hours, sometimes three, sometimes four. Total together is 1.5 hours, 1.5 days. Then I said, hmm, the turnover is quite a lot, so I multiply by 1.5. Turns out to be 2.7 million ringgit line stop. So I decided, I said, oh, okay, I just walked the line and said, I want to speak, may I see who is a facility manager? Um, then came a very old guy, 60 years old, Namadia Im Ichi Jalil. I said, Ichi Jalil, so 1.5 days, the line stopped. What caused it? He said, mm, it up all the pumps. The pumps break down suddenly. And he doesn't know when the pumps break down. It breaks down suddenly, he has to stop the line. So suddenly it occurred to me, he doesn't need any platform or software. He only needs a simple sensor. He has got 20 pumps. He cannot know which pump will break down. They all look the same, yeah? And he does a good job. He, prevent, he, predictive, he preventively maintains the pumps. But the pumps break down suddenly. Now with a simple sensor, he's able to track on his mobile phone that pump playing up, you know? So it gives him about two to three weeks time for him to, to act without stopping the line. So you see how much is the investment? Simple sensor, simple gateway onto his mobile phone, no license involved, no software involved, and he can manage to stop the, to prevent line stop. 
So the management told me, Royce, if you can even reduce the line stock by half, that is already 2.75 million divided by half, they save one point something. So the thing is, expensive? I don't think so. It comes back to say, where is really the problem? In my 170 factories that I've been, really nobody really sit down to ask each other where is really the problem. Because those people also don't want to admit the problem. To admit the problem is to say, I have a problem with my equipment or my process. So the beginning is to get a team. And this one, the pros and cons that I saw just now, why it fails, the, the many times I've seen, they always put the IT guy to be leading in the uh, digitalization program. That's the wrong person to do it. It has to be a team, not just the IT. It has to be the IT, the process engineer, the production, and led by the boss, especially if it's an SME company, it must be led by the boss himself, yeah, to know. And you'll be very surprised, the solutions is nowhere, anywhere, like everyone says. Because in everybody's mind, they think that digitalization, the solution is always robots, robots, robots. No, it's not. Yeah, Bosch, we make robots. If you want to buy robots, please see me. But um, I'm just saying it is not the solution. Robots is only one of the solutions. And thankfully, I'm very happy to uh, announce that the Malaysian SME, the solutions to your problem is not big. Because Malaysia, thankfully, we are quite organized. You know? mm. We are quite organized. Yeah? So, uh, so the problems are easily arrested. Thank you. Uh, this, I think, a very common thing that uh, being felt, even in organization like Srim, we are going through digital transformation, and we were, because we feel that it is very important. Although it is not a manufacturing thing that we are talking about, but it's still related, I mean, looking at the problem. I like the, 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 the case in point where it was a sensor needed, mm. and that saved two point over million, uh, by giving that uh, maintenance guy uh, two to three weeks heads up that his pumps are giving some funny paying up. Uh, so, um, and that comes back to what Mr. Chu said. You got in your steps of Kaizen looking at the root cause, not just taking the solution from the shelf. Yeah. I think uh, it's related in, in that sense. I would like to move on to the uh, question. Next question is uh, based on your experience working. I know you all have been working with the local manufacturing companies for many years. Uh, now this is the this is the sort of like the crunch point. Where do you see the Malaysian manufacturing industry needs most help? In other words, how SME can move towards digitalization that is both affordable and cost effective. So it's like a summary of what we've been discussing. Who wants to try and uh, have a go with this? Mr. Lee, maybe you. Uh, okay. <coughs> so I think first uh, first thing is, uh, I think the SME need a lot of help. I think first is, uh, I think from government perspective, uh, uh, we could create a portal, at least a one information portal that SME can go and search for information relevant to digitalization, to ICT, it may not be all in one because you, 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 we can't go to this portal and you can see Huawei, Hitachi, Bosch. Yeah. There's a lot of solution provided, but at least we provide a simple portal for the SME to understand the basic of digitalization, the basic concept and some direction. And if, if they need some help, yes, there are some companies that could help them. So at least I think the first thing that we should provide them a portal, a portal of information. So I, uh, uh, and there's not a lot of portals, a lot of information uh, that is available. But at least there should be one, a more simple, a simple organized portal that let uh, most of the SME can just go and access to the basic information and seek for help. So that is the first. Secondly, is uh, when they do need help. Uh, so where, which department or which source they can ask for. So I think with this, uh, we need to also form a small task force. The task force can be for, from us, solution provider. It can be from any consultant. It can be from a government uh, agency. I think, I think it's, like, it's like form a, a virtual CIO team to support them. Because most of SME, they cannot afford to hire one CIO. Mm. They, 
they may have IT managers, uh, but their IT manager may be just still in the old, old, old knowledge. Mm -hmm. So they may not have our access of technology through our global experience. Mm -hmm. So we can form that sort of like a virtual team that we can advise to them. Great. That, that is the two points that mm -hmm. we can assist Thank you. the SME. Chuchu, Royce, you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I think that for the Malaysia SME, I think uh, I, have a, I have two points that I would like to highlight and share. First is thing that I think uh, all the SME's uh, owner or, that, or the operator, they have to change a little bit the uh, mindset. I mean, they try to understand uh, what they need and uh, what is the real meaning of the industrial revolution. I'm not saying industrial 4.0, because uh, maybe some of them are industrial IR uh, 2.0, maybe it's a 3.5 something. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't say that 2 or 3 or 4, but we say that what kind of the transformation you need. Okay, and then you go to study. I think that study is very important. What I'm saying is that study is very important, because the more use case, in Japan, you say the case called a use case. So use case means the success story that already applied in other countries. So the more use case you study, the more key or the point that you can learn from them. So that you know uh, what you should choose, what you should do. Okay. And uh, of course, one SME cannot do everything. So I believe that uh, the organization like the Sirin or the big company they need to take the initiative to support the SME. For example, in Japan, most of the big companies, they have their own the technology the, uh, technical team who is uh, fully uh, dedicated to support their sub vendors. So when I was in the Japan, I um, worked in the sourcing department. So we sourcing department, we have a big team. The team is just only to support our SME to help them to improve their quality, their operation efficiency. Because we believe that if the SME, our supplier, they cannot do the good job, I cannot get a good sup uh, supply, I cannot come up with a good product. So that's why I think that now is the time maybe the government not just only give the incentive, but maybe we can utilize the incentive in other ways. Like for example, they have to try to encourage uh, the big uh, company to come up with a team to train their subcon, to share their knowledge, to share their use case uh, with the subcon. So the SME will have a more opportunity to know, to, know uh, to understand what is happening outside. Maybe outside we use a different way to produce the kind of the uh, component, but they may not know. Right? So I believe that supplier, I mean the SME, they have to work hard for them by themselves, but the government and the big company also need to support them. The support is not by the cash, but share the information or train them and uh, share our knowledge. So uh, work as a team, uh, as a team, then we move together, for, uh, move forward to challenge the future. Thank you. Royce? Well, may I add, um, I think uh, unlike the three of us sitting here, we are giants in our field. We can see upstream from our supply down to our customer. All SMEs cannot have this view. They can have no access to the upstream and downstream. They can only take care of what is underneath their roof. Yeah. So if underneath their roof, so if we say what is in their roof, what is upstream and what is downstream, wow, I speak very loud. Okay. What is upstream and downstream in the operation? The upstream will be their material handling, their warehouse. And I, believe me, I have been to 170 plants, all of them, the warehouse management is always managed by foreign worker managed by lowly paid people yeah and the amount of material inside there and mix and things so i give you a very good example production planner upstairs she plans tomorrow uh, the customer wants 20 pallets of goods so she plans she looks at the erp yes there's 24. tomorrow comes she prepares the equipment prepares the people comes tomorrow only 16 pallets of things comes up so what happened to the deficit of four People are already waiting there, machine already dedicated, right? So the only person that will be happy are the foreign worker. Tonight we're going to work OT. 
the next few days we're going to work early to, to fulfill these four pallets. And sometimes, when you can't find the thing, what do you do? They have to air freight the thing or fast deliver this thing from the suppliers, which makes suppliers not happy. So the cost goes up. So what I'm trying to say in an SME, the upstream will be in warehouse management. Mm. Then equipment utilization. Okay, this digitalization has a fantastic word called OEE, but basically it means machine utilization. So if you have real-time data from your machine, the business owner, the production planner, the production person will know really how am I utilizing the equipment. Uh, CIRIM has done uh, all the RA and they discover conclusively that the uh, machine utilization in Malaysia, what is the number? Shockingly, it's about 35%. OEE is 35%. That means a machine is only 35% utilized. So once the moment you have digitalization, you are able to know exactly what is causing the problem of low utilization. Yeah? So remember, you have not yet invested in anything. You have only invested in getting data, processing the data. And the various people from the production planner to the production process engineer and to the boss himself will know why is my machine only 35% utilized? Mm. It looks very busy, eh? lots of people working, mm. movements, but not productive. Mm. Yeah? This is the true meaning of digitalization, where you discover what is really causing the problem. Right, thank you, uh, panelists. Uh, I want to sort of like end, uh, going to the end of this discussion. Um, there are a lot of points mentioned how we help. Uh, Mr. Lim from Huawei said about that we should create portal task force. Um, um, Chu, you mentioned that uh, we need to have um, people at Sirim assisting. I mean, we've been doing that. And um, I think you're looking at um, what was the findings of these things. We, 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 we've seen it. And I did allude it earlier on about lean manufacturing. Mm. Many have not gone through the best practices. Mm. I think if they gone through that, they would have done mm. utilization and things like that. Mm. Um, so, this is from Syrian point of view. If Syrian were to host and establish a training center, we call it experience center, for SME to learn, experience, sh you know, share our use cases, successful use cases, and to make it cost-effective, affordable for them, how would your organization be part of this, this uh, initiative, this partnership? How would you like to be in this experience center? I'm always the leader person. Uh, yeah, I think this is a very good uh, opportunity. Uh, uh, and I believe that uh, the big company like Hitachi so we are keen to support because it is important for us to share what is the latest technology or what is the best way to produce a good quality product uh, for the, to, to share with the SME. As I mentioned just now, if the SME is the level it cannot improve, I mean that uh, we actually also cannot get a good supply from Malaysia. So I, I, I don't see there is no reason that why we can't uh, support. Of course, we still have uh, some limitation, but a lot of things I think that we can do. For example, we share our use case, or maybe we can uh, request, ask our engineer to give uh, some uh, training program to share the information, or well, the success story, how we train our SME in Japan. Uh, I think there's a lot of things to do. Not necessarily the hardware, but maybe we also can contribute in the software side, mm. I mean the, the knowledge side. Thank you. Yeah. So I think from uh, from Huawei side, um, uh, we are already making our experience into the cloud services. So um, so our our assistant to the SME will be uh, we are able to offer the so-called standardized and affordable cloud services uh, to all the SME through uh, through uh, collaboration with Siri. Uh, and of course, uh, it's not only is already affordable. We will also offer like you no know, free of usage for three months, for example, or uh, 
2,000 to 3,000 hours of free usage. So we can offer a free trial for them to test, mm -hmm. to see what is going on when they come to the call. Mm -hmm. Then only you will start to decide whether they will continue to How pay. many months free trial? Three months. <laughs> Oh. Okay. I think case by case. Case by case. Yeah, case by case. Uh, what kind of the no, yeah, program? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do agree. agree yeah. So, so uh, of course, this offer we know we we are. I was just. It yeah. was a joke, but it's quite serious yeah. because a lot of when we help our SMEs, right? They they will when they see their ROI, then only they will say, oh. "Wow, I, it was a good thing I invested." So sometimes uh, they, this is the decision they want to invest. Yeah. They don't want. They don't know that. Uh, the ROI, yeah. and as you know, SME is a very cash flow sure. tight very cash flow, tight. very tight. So, giving free trials, I yeah. think, is looks yeah. uh, simple, but actually, it can make helps a lot. The SMEs. Thank you for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Uh, you so, want secondly, add? is uh, we are able to offer knowledge sharing. Mm -hmm. So, if uh, Sirim is organizing any training platform, whether it's online. Or it's offline at the saving premises. No, so we are able to uh, uh, provide the expertise required uh, to be shared online as well as to hands on with the SME about how to use cloud AI technologies. Thank you, Royce. Yeah, the German Prof, I, German I, technology I, side. Yeah, <laughs> Prof, I think uh, thanks to Sirim, I personally have uh, participated in quite a quite many master classes that right. Sirim hosted. And um, so that soft uh, training exposure has been given and you're still ongoing. Yes. So this experience center that you mentioned, uh, as you already know, they're also existing already in Malaysia. Yeah. So, uh, and they are also under HRDF claimable. Right now, as we speak, when Pajana is launched, these things are being trained free to companies who contribute to HRD, HRDF. Yes. Yeah. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about sensors, gateways, uh, PLCs, drives, control, robotics, and things like that. These are all found in an equipment that uh, people, you can send your people for training. The training can last from three days, five days, ten days, can be broken up in many things. Why this training is important? You need your people to touch the thing, feel it, pair it to their mobile phone, get data. They will feel the word to describe it is empowered. Once they get data in their hands, they will feel empowered and say, wow, I know what is happening now. Then only they can start thinking about solution. Because for as long as they have no data in their hand, they cannot make any decision. Great. Um, we are in the last question I, I like to post. Um, and uh, we have uh, audience here. We have audience in Zoom mm -hmm. and also Facebook Live. What would be quickly? What would be the two important takeaway points from each of your organization for the audience who are coming from SMEs mm. from today's uh, webinar? Yeah. If you have three, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> just, think just two. Yeah, I think uh, uh, first, I think uh, the suggestion should be uh, for those uh, audience that participating in today's event is uh, you should really come and join. Uh, all the events that uh, a lot of government agencies has been organized for them, including the one that organized by Siri. So I think that is the first step that you should go and participate. Uh, that, that first step is important uh, to really access to this uh, information and technology. Uh, the second point is uh, uh, for those uh, use cases that I've, uh, I've been mentioning just now, like you know, how Hexar transformed. So just come to HuaweiCloud.com, uh, then you can able to assess and to understand more about this technology and you are able to get the fees from. Mm. Um, yes. So that is the two suggestions. Thank you. Yes. Royce? Prof, I think um, uh, over the last three years, I realized that uh, I've, been to, I've spoken in many conferences. I know, not, notice many companies send people. It always is send one or two person. Comes, goes back, the knowledge is lost in translation because industrial 4.0 digitalization is quite a big subject. Early uh, end of December, January and February, I was very lucky. I was indirectly appointed by the government agency to be a trainer. So I was full-time training the industry. I realized one thing. Companies that came as a whole company for training is successful. 
individuals that came for training, not successful. Nothing gets done. But when it comes as head of departments and one director or the boss himself turns up, the momentum builds up. Why is that? Because everyone is on the same page. They hear the same vocabulary. They hear what are the solutions available. They have not yet made the solutions, yeah? but at least now they have learned. So I have developed a model called TCOM, T-C-O-M. T stands for training, C stands for, if you need it, consultation. O is your operations to be handheld, to develop a journey. Then finally, M to make the management. It's not the other way. It's not management first. It is, surprisingly, training. Training can be one day, two days, three days. Yeah, intensive, but everyone is on the same page, hearing the same thing. Yeah, very true, very true. Uh, for my side, I believe that uh, all kinds of uh, transformation should be built on uh, on a kind of uh, co-creative collaboration. What I mentioned just now, mean that transformation must be two ways. You share your pain point, I share with you my knowledge. Okay, and uh, like the Roy just said now, the whole team, whole company have to involve. It's just only one team or one or two person involved. There's no impact because you will have a problem of internal conflict. Someone may not agree with you, someone may not understand what you are trying to do. So when the SND want to do the transformation, please think how to bring the whole team work together. And then you try to engage with the third parties, must be the two ways communication. All the company have to involve and create a kind of called co-creative collaboration. This is very important. And then lastly, Transformation is a kind of a journey. We cannot solve the problem, we cannot come up with results in one month or one year. Maybe it will take you two years, three years or five years. We does it take about 100 years <laughs> to develop. But today we still move forward to train ourselves. So I think that the most important thing is that when we talk about transformation, please think about what is the plan and what is the step by step that you need to go together with your uh, supporter or your uh, system provider. Thank you. Uh, we will now move into the Q&A session uh, to allow our audience who are in the cloud, I guess, to come in to ask questions. All right, we have the uh, question, very long, from Su Fong <coughs> Lu. Lu. Japanese way is always go back to basic and root cause analysis. Malaysian SMEs, besides going for cost reduction, waste elimination, and operational effectiveness, should start to learn using digital tools like QR code, scanner, sensors, etc., for process visibility and traceability. These steps are fundamental steps towards technological innovation and digitalization. Also, training for employees in Industry 4.0, or Industrial Revolution 4.0. Uh, form task force, uh, gradually find the pain points and measure the process improvement. Government agencies like MPC, CIRIM are there to help. Even MNCs like Hitachi, Bosch and Huawei are always ready to help local SMEs. But why do you think many of the SMEs are not as so aggressively getting support and advice of, of, for this kind? Well, uh, or you think that many SMEs have done so? I think not an easy question to answer, but anyone want to try this? Maybe, uh, Royce, your experience, mm -hmm. yeah. because you train so many of them. Why are they not so aggressive getting support and advice? I, I, I've spoken to many, many bosses, and, um, and my father himself is a boss, so I understand his mindset. Um, the problem with this digitalization is intangible, is data. Money you can count, <coughs> hardware you can count, barang you can count, stocks you can count, data you cannot count. Mm. And already many, this COVID now proves many companies did not dare to park their data in the cloud. Yeah? So why? Because they, they, they don't even trust the, the, the data to go out to the cloud. In the first place, they cannot feel data, so they are not even extracting data. Do you know, there are still many companies, big ones, the bosses still insist to see things on paper. To tell them about e-banking is alien to them. Now, e-banking also, they cannot handle it. There is no way about this data. So this is one, major, uh, one problem. The other problem is they are also reluctant to pay for software services. 
you know, to pay for hardware, yeah, I can see it. To pay for stocks, I can. To employ people, I can see it. But for software, they can. They don't want to pay for it mm. because they think it's just software. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with you. It's intangible, very difficult to put um, the, the money. Mm. And I think this is um, things that we have to educate them. Um, so that's, that's from your angle. Uh, from Huawei, uh, Lim, do you have anything? Why no. do you think they are not aggressively moving into this? Why are they doing this wait and see kind of thing? I think, I think it's the mindset and the atmosphere. So if you look at what happened in China, so in China, most of the startup, uh, they are really cognitive. Cognitive in the sense of uh, they build everything from the cloud. Mm. So they don't own anything. They, mm. they don't own server, they don't, there's no IT departments. Mm. So everything they build, their, their apps, their, their products are actually a digital products. Mm. So um, in China, there's very strong cognitive mindset mm. and the environment. So for those youngsters, startup, uh, I would say the small, medium enterprise, they, are, they tend to have a physical store and will definitely have a store somewhere in Taobao. Mm. Mm. So the, the mindset is that the whole market has been educated that if you don't own something on the digital, it's like alien. Mm. That's actually very common in China. Mm. So the whole China market, it gives you that environment that, you know, if you do business in a conventional way, you just cannot survive at all. You just can't compete at all. You can't even reach to your customer. So I think that atmosphere is not happened here in Malaysia. So, uh, and of course, it's, it needs times to develop. It needs some uh, effort to put in. So I think it's not about our SME is not aggressive. It's just that they are, uh, they are not live in the market. The best way for them to move is no. They have to really suffer until they make the change. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I think COVID nineteen will definitely give them a hit now. Mm. So I think it's, it's, now is the right time for them to really reset, mm. to change their mindset, to learn, to join the training. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is two points. One is the bridging. I would like to say the bridging. Because you see that uh, most, quite many uh, big companies is ready to support. And uh, I believe that uh, many SME also struggling and uh, try to transform themselves to survive in order they can survive. But the problem is that why these two groups, I would like to say two groups, why these two groups, they cannot link to each other? I think that the bridging, this is the problem. Maybe you know, we need a uh, a, a, a kind of organization like the CRIM or NPC or someone to do something that how to bridge you know, the SME and the big company who are willing to support them. And then to share, as I mentioned just now, to share the knowledge is very important. Like uh, Mr. Lee says just now, share the knowledge, then let the SME understand what is uh, happening outside. Change their mindset. Don't worry about the challenge. You may fail, but if you don't challenge, you will die. Mm. So instead of you die, then better you run and pass it. But of course, there must be someone to, as a call that the driver, to lead them, to let them know, hey, this is uh, something new that you have to look into it. And then this is uh, some of the success story. If you, as I mentioned just now, the use case. So the more use case you share with the SME, they know how to avoid the risk. So they can hedge the risk to avoid to do the mistake for the investment. Then from that, another point is that maybe we should uh, encourage the big company, especially the local big company, to think again about the supply chain management. Are you willing to create something, ecosystem, to help the SME or to support your supplier to improve their capability or the capacity? So that we, the SME will have a more confidence to invest because if they know that they invest, they will get the return and the principal or the buyer or the big customer will continue to look into detail and continue to support them. So this is why that in Japan, we seldom 
every time go for the e-sourcing or the open tender. But rather than we spend some money and time to train our SME to make sure that they come out with a big, uh, the, the good quality product, improve the technology. And because of that, SME also feel comfortable to invest because they know that if they improve the quality capability, then they will continue to get the support uh, from the big user. So I think that bridging and the ecosystem environment is very important. Yeah. You, you hit on the, on a very important point and uh, there is uh, another question, uh, question for our audience here in the auditorium. Um, please walk up to the mic. My name is Zuriani. I'm from Missionary Technology Center. Okay, uh, thank you, Donors, because I learned a lot today. Uh, okay, I just want to share with you, we are having, uh, we call it supporting SME a lot and uh, to improve their productivity. Okay, when we talk about digitalization, they like the idea, but they, uh, some of them lack of confidence. Maybe, perhaps, maybe the awareness, like Mr. Tan mentioned just now. <clears throat> In here, uh, maybe Mr. Chiu uh, can share with us um, how Hitachi do it to create awareness to the industry so that we can learn. And uh, maybe using the use case, all the stuff that I learned today. Uh, thank you. A two question for you. <laughs> I think that uh, the key point here is that uh, the how much information that the SME can uh, get, uh, and also how much uh, the opportunity they can uh, access to the third party, and uh, also to understand what is outside. So I think that the people don't have the confidence is because they don't know what they want, firstly. And also they don't know what is the usage of this system in detail. So the people will doubt, the, the doubt to, to invest. And then they will try to think left and right, left and right. And then after that, come out with a, end up with a nothing. So my, my thinking is that uh, in order to create the awareness of the, this kind of a technology uh, investment or the, the, the solutions, the trend, I think the, the company like us or the government agency, we should uh, provide the more training and uh, or more conference you know, to share, to let the people understand this is a kind of the proven technology and subject to you how to utilize it. And of course, we Hitachi, we can say that we Hitachi is ready to share the knowledge with you how to utilize the solution and the technology. So I mean the call to go through this kind of training and the information exchange and become the two-way communication, then this can help the people to understand what they have to do and which one is safe for them to do. Okay. Prof, may I add? Please. Um, from my experience, I've seen many companies actually experience two cycles of digitalization already. Companies that have invested money in CRM and also in ERP are actually digital solutions by themselves. ERP is more on the management, on, on sales, and also in accounts. They basically use that. Yeah. Already many companies are struggling with ERP. Many. No matter how much training they went. Bosses became very disillusioned and frustrated. And you will find that companies have ERP and still manual paper running. Still on Excel and on ERP. I've seen companies like this. These are particularly the SMEs because they don't have resources to en employ more people just to run the ERP. Now, I would not be surprised that many bosses would, with all this experience, spending a lot of money on ERP and yet getting very little benefit out of it. So I can say that those who have invested, they will find that, oh, it's so troublesome. Yeah. So, I mean, when I talk from Bosch in Germany and Japan, all these are high-wage <coughs> country very expensive, they don't digitalize, they die. But a lot of SME owners here, they feel that if they don't digitalize, they employ a lot of people, they still won't die. And they have a point. They have a point, yeah? 
So I would want to put myself, humble myself down and say, not the Bosch, the big Bosch in the world where it's high labor cost. I need to tailor it down to Malaysia, which is not so high labor cost, but yet the people are also not so educated. People don't read manuals. Yeah? Uh, people don't, don't understand what is written. So therefore, digitalization has to be tailored very simply for them, easy to understand. And this I see in Bosch when I joined 27 years ago in our Bosch Penang plant. We employ about nearly 5,000 people. I saw that they apply digitalization, but in simple things like famous traffic light colors, big numbers. And all the people that work in the line are all from Kampong Kampong, you know. Mm, mm. And yet they can catch it. They catch it, they understand it, and they feed back to the very line. So digitalization for us started a long time ago. And as Mr. Chu said, it is the people, for the people, back to the people. And many times, decision never go upstairs to come down. Decision is solved on that level itself. And many, like that, your problem is resolved, cost is known. So in that sense, where is the robot? Where are all the fancy, fancy hardware? No, they are not there. It is by people, for people, tailored for our Malaysian environment. Specifically, I like to say SME. Mm -hmm. There's another question coming from the Zoom. This time from the Zoom. Hi, all speakers. Good topics discussed this afternoon. My question, can we discuss further how digitalization can be implemented in high-mix, low-volume environment? Uh, not uh, Louis Vuitton. Yeah, I remember LM, LVMH, isn't it? Um, so high mix, low volume. Concerns on no single product run continuously and of course the volume is low. This would drag the cost concerns as well. Perhaps uh, Royce, you want to try to respond to this? Yeah, this high mix, low volume environment is exactly what Malaysia is. We are no longer uh, one production line dedicated to one product <coughs> or one part number. One part number is not running in the thousands of pieces. By the way, HMLV is a success of Bosch because they were able to use one single line simultaneously to run many different part numbers of small quantity and yet at the same time achieving e economy of scale prices, cost. Yeah? That is a success factor. So, and when I looked at what Bosch does, even I was amazed because it is not even taught as an industrial 4.0 uh, thing. So if you Google for it, it is called um, active, uh, active Assist. We call it Active Assist. It is using a series, it's actually helping the person who has no knowledge how to do the thing or forgotten how to do the thing to know how to do it instantaneously and, call, and maintain the quality and the right speed. So this HMLV is a very good question, whoever that asked this, yeah? because this exactly re represents Malaysia. Yeah. 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 I fully agree, because uh, we Hitachi also have our own product, mm -hmm. and uh, Hitachi is very, uh, have a quite big portion of the production is the high mix and the low volume. Mm -hmm. So uh, usually when we go for the digitalization for that kind of the sector business, so usually we will have a, a few keywords. First, we think about the data consolidation because uh, you have the different types of the uh, product. So you need uh, what kind of the data you need. So you've got the consolidation of the data. Number two, visualize. How you visualize the data? Do you have a dashboard can immediately show that everything what's happening in the production line from upstream go to downstream? As well as for the high mix and the low volume, you will not have uh, too many things uh, components in the warehouse. But suddenly the customer changed the requirement. Mm. Then you have to change the production line. So without the complete data, I mean that if you are not able to consolidate all the data in the, from upstream go to downstream, then you may have a, a problem in the call the shortage, you know, data shortage in certain area. And also without the visualization, you don't know what is the problem. Mm -hmm. So my belief is that data consolidation, when you design the system, you have to think about the whether you are fully consolidated all the necessary data. Number two, are you able to visualize it? Let's say put everything in one dashboard. And again, number three, whether you are, after you do the implementation, whether you have the key person or the expert 
to run the data and learn the data and upgrade the data. I think the last one is very important. A lot of people, they spend a lot of money, like the Roy said, the ELP. Why the people spend a lot of ELP, money for the ELP, but they cannot fully utilize it? Yeah. Because we don't know how to use it. We just uh, follow the consultant to design and then to implement it. And we also don't know whether we really, really need the ELP or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that this is the three key points. Whether you need it or not. If you need it, then you have to consolidate all the necessary data and visualize it. Thank you. Uh, I would like to end uh, the session because we have uh, really run out of time. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I believe it has been a fruitful session for, I think, for myself and also for the panelists. Um, there were questions, good questions, and I hope to the audience yourself, um, this is a topic that uh, is close to CIRIM as we have been uh, assisting SMEs uh, in trying to move them to the journey 4.0 and we realize digitalization is, is very important. Uh, before we end today's program, uh, let's take a sneak peek of our Smart Manufacturing Experience Center. Uh, thank you once again to the panelists, Mr. Chu of Hitachi, Mr. Royce of Bosch at Redswalls and Mr. Lim of Huawei and everyone who followed this session on Zoom and Sirim FB. Have a good day. Assalamualaikum. Thank <laughs> you.